Hello. I am Sarah from Analytics Power. Thanks for stopping by our channel. Are you interested in listening to amazing stories on how different countries have faced tough economic challenges and managed to get out of recession? How Algeria lost a great opportunity to be one of the world's economic leaders? How Singapore has turned from a very poor nation to the third strongest economy in the world? How loose monetary policies helped some economies to boom and caused a deflation to others? Which country set the lowest interest rate in the world over the last 50 years? You will find answers to these questions and more throughout this video, so please make sure to watch it till the end. This video is introduced to you by Analytics Power. If you are interested in watching trends and reviews for product and services, and as well as statistics on different topics that are delivered using wonderful animated infographics, then please make sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the subscribe button below and activating the bell. I will start by giving some theoretical background so you can understand some of the commercial terms in this video. However, you can skip this part and move directly to this minute. Banks normally set different rates for deposit and lending activities. Lending rate is the bank rate that usually meets the short and medium term financing needs of the private sector. This rate is normally differentiated according to creditworthiness of borrowers and objectives of financing. The terms and conditions attached to these rates differ from country to another. Interest rate targets are a vital tool of monetary policy and are taken into account when dealing with variables like investment, inflation, and unemployment. The central banks of countries generally tend to reduce interest rates when they wish to increase investment and consumption in the country's economy. However, a low interest rate as a macroeconomic policy can be risky and may lead to the creation of an economic bubble in which large amounts of investments are poured into the real estate market and stock market. In developed economies, interest rate adjustments are made to keep inflation within a target range for the health of economic activities or cap the interest rate concurrently with economic growth to safeguard economic momentum. Germany, for example, has experienced deposit interest rates from 14% in 1969 down to almost 2% 2 in 2003. In the past two centuries, interest rates have been variously set, either by national governments or central banks. For example, the Federal Reserve Federal Funds rate in the United States has varied between about 0.25% and 19% from 1954 to 2008 while the Bank of England base rate varied between 0.5% and 15% from 1989 to 2009. Germany experienced rates close to 90% in the 1920s, down to about 2% in the new millennium. In Zimbabwe, during an attempt to tackle spiraling hyperinflation in 2007, the Central Bank of Zimbabwe increased interest rates for borrowing to 800%. Upon his inauguration in 1969, Nixon inherited a recession from Lyndon Johnson, who had simultaneously spent generously on the Great Society and the Vietnam War. Nixon was considered a conservative man with liberal ideas. Congress, despite some protests, went along with Nixon and continued to fund the war and increased social welfare spending. In 1971, Nixon broke the last link to gold, turning the American dollar into a fiat currency. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability 
and in the best interest of the United States. As a result of Nixon's decision, the dollar was devalued, and millions of foreigners holding dollars saw the value of dollars slashed. However, for the President Nixon, the primary concern was not dollar holders or deficits or even inflation. He feared another recession. He and others that were running for re-election wanted the economy to boom. The way to do that, Nixon reasoned, was to pressure the Fed for low interest rates. Nixon fired Fed Chairman William McChesney Martin and installed presidential councillor Arthur Burns as Martin's successor in early 1970. Although the Fed is supposed to be solely dedicated to money creation policies that promote growth without excessive inflation, Burns was quickly taught the political facts of life. Nixon wanted cheap money, low interest rates, that would promote growth in the short term and make the economy seem strong, in the eyes of voters. The policy worked well in the short term. Many Americans were awed by the temporarily low unemployment and strong growth numbers of 1972. Therefore, they overwhelmingly re-elected the Democratic Congress and Republican President, Richard Nixon, who carried 49 out of 50 states in the election. Later after the election year, Inflation starts to rise again, but blames were focused on the Arab countries and oil pricing during year 1973. The Libyan economy, before the discovery of petrol, was backward. Therefore, the Libyan government priority, in the first development plan, between 1973 to 1975, was the agricultural sector, that took precedence over the industrial sector. The Libyan economy achieved a high growth rate during the 70s, which peaked 9.2% of the GDP. The oil price shocks, during 1973 to 1974, and in 1979, resulted in a large transfer of wealth to Nigeria. Public expenditure increased greatly, as did the country's access to international capital markets. However, later in the 70s, evidence of a Dutch disease emerged, and agriculture, the main non-oil tradable sector, declined. Following the collapse of oil prices in 1982, and the rise in real interest rates, Nigeria experienced rising inflation, strict rationing of foreign exchange, and the possibility of debt rescheduling. The economy of Burma currently known as Myanmar, was severely suffering during the 1960s. In the first Burmese Socialist Program Party Congress in 1971, several minor economic reforms were made, in light of the failures of the economic policy pursued throughout the 1960s. The Burmese government asked to rejoin the World Bank, joined the Asian Development Bank, and sought more foreign aid and assistance. The 20-year plan, an economic plan divided into five increments of implementation, was introduced to develop the country's natural resources, including agriculture, forestry, oil, and natural gas, through state development. These reforms brought living standards back to pre-World War II levels and stimulated economic growth during the 70s. In 1978, Japan was about to recover from the severe impact made by the first oil price shock during 1973 to 1974, but it does not stand long until the second oil price shock arose in 1979 and the Japanese economy was seriously impacted again. On the other side, the economy of Kuwait has reached a peak due to high oil prices in the 1970s, and achieved GDP growth rates of 765%. Later during the 1980s, the Kuwait economy experienced a significant decrease in their GDP, due to a continuous decrease in oil prices during that period. The 1970s and 1980s period in Algeria, is one of the incredible lost opportunities. Algeria has condemned itself to repeat and compound the same tragic economic mistakes. 
In the 1970s and continuing in the period from 1980 to 1985, Algeria has achieved an annual growth rate of 5 to 6 percent. This was attributed mainly to the increase in oil prices in the late 1970s. In 1981, the Trans-Mediterranean Natural Gas Pipeline from Tunisia to Sicily, and on to Naples, Italy, was completed, which substantially boosted the sales of Algerian natural gas to Europe. In the early 1980s, the focus of the Algerian government has shifted toward privatization, and Algeria's socialist direction has been modified somewhat. For example, in 1982, a new private investment law was issued, which created new private sector investment opportunities. Standards of living have risen to those of an intermediately developed country, but food production has fallen well below the level of self-sufficiency. Later in the second half of the 1980s, the macroeconomic situation worsened, in large part, because of the misdirected investments of the 1970s, coupled with the secular decline of oil prices, particularly after 1985. Equally as significant, was the decline of the opportunities for migration, which was blocked off by European reluctance to increase the size of its immigrant labor force from North Africa. In addition, the economic liberalization program enriched the elite, which means that few people in the social groups at the top of the rankable social power scale have benefited from economic growth, without improving a lot of ordinary Algerians. The activities of the economic elite, linked to the single political party, together with the growth of a parallel trading economy, that depended on political protection, and official connivance, were rendered more intolerable, by an ineffective economic liberalization program, under the Chadli Benjadid presidency. Low interest rate is good for boosting the economy, but alone is not sufficient, without an effective economic reform plan. For example, in Albania, by mid of the 1980s, the figures began showing an increase in budget deficits, a decline in the rate of growth of GDP, deterioration of the balance of payments, and an increase of broad money. The necessity of a macroeconomic maneuver in the monetary field became clearer after 1985. Accordingly, the Albanian government during the period from 1986 to 1990 has implemented a new monetary policy that relies on a very low interest rate. An easy borrowing process of the state-owned enterprises and soft budget constraints stimulated the monetary expansion. The ceiling to the interest rate on bank credits remained in power, while no sanctions to the unperformed enterprise debts emerged. In 1990, short-term credits to the industrial enterprises rose 28.4% from the previous year, going mostly to pay wage bills in overstuffed conditions, or were used inefficiently. The dramatic situation in net foreign assets, of the State Bank of Albania in 1990, was due to the recent deterioration of the balance of payments, the increase in foreign debt to the foreign commercial banks, and bad transactions in foreign exchange markets. By the end of 1989, and at the beginning of the 1990s, a growing wave of revolts and an overall discontent made the government review its wage policy. Instead of introducing radical reforms in privatization, restructuring, and social safety net, the government made a compromise, mostly for political reasons. The workers laid off by the enterprises, forced out of business by the lack of production factors, were being paid 80% of their former salary. This policy, however, was a poor one in the economic term, and contributed to aggravating the situation. In 1965, upon independence from Malaysia, Singapore faced a small domestic market, and high levels of unemployment and poverty. 70% of Singapore's households lived in badly overcrowded conditions. Unemployment averaged 14%, GDP per capita was 516 US dollar, and half of the population was illiterate. Singapore has gone through a rapid transformation during the last five decades. From an entrepot predominantly, towards commerce and services, in the mid-1960s into an economy, which presently specializing in high-value manufacturing activities, and regional financial hub for business services in East Asia. 
The 1990s posed a great question for Singapore as to how they would reinvent their economy. The 1990s emergence of efficient manufacturing firms in Southeast Asia challenges the nation with such a small labor force and land restrictions. Accordingly, in 1991, the Singapore government issued a new strategic economic plan, which set the strategies and programs for Singapore to realize a vision to attain the status and characteristics of a first league developed country within the next 30 to 40 years. The strategic economic plan was more bent on pursuing education and human resources development to encourage export. The Singapore government subsidies private investors through its active policies, such as investment incentives, high-quality infrastructure provisions, and through education and training. Moreover, subsidies were mainly concentrated on strategic industrial clusters, and those were targeted by the government to persuade foreign investors. The government collaborated with several multinational enterprises towards upgrading Singapore industries and technologies to high technology and high value added manufacturing. For example, an offer of larger tax concessions and breaks to foreign investors who are planning to invest in high tech and high value added manufacturing products. The government also made resources available to open Nanyang Technical University. Besides, huge funds were made available to the National University of Singapore to enhance its computing and engineering, particularly R&D activities. The economy of Singapore has become a highly developed free market economy. It has been ranked as the most open in the world, third least corrupt, most pro-business, with low tax rates, and has the third highest per capita GDP in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. In the decades following World War II, Japan implemented stringent tariffs and policies to encourage the people to save their income. With more money in banks, loans and credit became easier to obtain with a very low interest rate, and with Japan running large trade surpluses, the yen appreciated against foreign currencies. This allowed local companies to invest in capital resources more easily than their overseas competitors, which reduced the price of Japanese-made goods and widened the trade surplus further. With the yen appreciating, financial assets became lucrative. With so much money readily available for investment, more money was directed to the real estate market and related stocks in the stock market. The rates for housing, stocks, and bonds rose so much that at one point the government issued 100-a-year bonds, Additionally, banks granted increasingly risky loans. The Nikkei stock index hit its all-time high on 29 December 1989. At the height of the bubble, real estate was extremely overvalued. Prices for properties exceeded 1.5 million US dollar per square meter in some areas. By 2004, the bubble exploded, and the prices of the residential homes were a fraction of their peak. Trillions were wiped out with the combined collapse of the Tokyo stock and real estate markets. With Japan's economy driven by its high rates of reinvestment, this crash hit particularly hard. Investments were increasingly directed out of the country, and Japanese manufacturing firms lost some degree of their technological edge. The easily obtainable credit that had helped create and engorge the real estate bubble continued to be a problem for several years to come. As late as 1997, banks were still making loans that had a low guarantee of being repaid. Loan officers and investment staff had a hard time finding anything to invest in that would return a profit. Correcting the credit problem became even more difficult as the government began to subsidize failing banks and businesses, creating many so-called zombie businesses. In 2001, the Bank of Japan and the Japanese government tried to eliminate deflation in the economy by reducing interest rates. Despite having interest rates near zero for a long period, this strategy did not succeed. In July 2006, the zero-rate policy was ended. In 2008, the Japanese central bank still had the lowest interest rates in the developed world, and deflation continued due to the following issues. Insolvent companies, 
banks lent to companies and individuals that invested in real estate. When real estate values dropped, many loans went unpaid. The banks could try to collect on the land, but due to reduced real estate values, this would not pay off the loan. Banks have delayed the decision to collect on the land, hoping asset prices would improve. These delays were allowed by national banking regulators. Some banks make even more loans to these companies that are used to service the debt they already have. This continuing process is known as maintaining an unrealized loss, and until the assets are completely revalued and or sold off, and the loss realized, it will continue to be a deflationary force in the economy. Insolvent banks, banks with a large percentage of their loans which are non-performing loans for which payments are not being made, but have not yet written them off. These banks cannot lend more money until they increase their cash reserves to cover the bad loans. Thus the number of loans is reduced sooner, and fewer funds are available for economic growth. Fear of insolvent banks, Japanese people are afraid that banks will collapse, so they prefer to buy gold, or the treasury bonds of the United States or Japan, instead of saving their money in a bank account. People also save by investing in real estate. By the end of the year 2008, the UK economy was undergoing a serious recession. The GDP is falling, houses prices kept falling, and unemployment was continuously increasing. As the economy got smaller, lots of people lost their jobs, and employers stopped hiring. By the end of 2011, almost 2.7 million people were looking for work. The quarterly unemployment rate reached 8.4%. After five consecutive quarters of recession, the UK economy was in its longest recession on record. The year 2009 was considered the worst for Britain's economy, since at least the World War II. The English pound fell sharply against the dollar and euro, as dealers digested the bad news. The figure left output 5.2% lower than the same quarter last year. Accordingly, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, decided to reduce the interest rate significantly, reaching the lowest levels since the bank was founded in 169. The objective was to try avoiding inflation slipping beyond the inflation target of 1-3%. This loose monetary policy, alongside the increased public spending, from 38.9% of national income in 2007-2008, to 44.9% in 2009-2010 have helped cushion the economy from what would otherwise have been a much worse outcome. Having shrunk by more than 6% during the recession period, the UK economy took five years to get back to the size it was before the recession. The rate of employment improved, and the median real household income increased by 6%, although the earnings were lower, due to higher employment rates. By the year 2010, the Hungarian economy was continuously suffering for years, household debt had reached historic highs, as families struggled under the weight of foreign currency-denominated loans, and the annual budget deficit near 5%. The government and central bank have taken several measures to reform and stimulate the economy. Among these measures were First, the ease of ease administrative procedures for businesses, that has started in 2015, by introducing a new regulatory framework for electronic services, the transformation of several authorization procedures, into notification procedures, and the abolition or simplification of professional qualifications. Second, the introduction of a six-year wage and tax agreement structure, in November 2016, that reduced the tax wedge on labor income. A 12.8% wage increase, and an increase in employment rate, as nearly 70,000 jobs, were created. This helped to boost the standard of living of the Hungarian people, and increase their consumption, which has a direct stimulus effect on the economy, leading to more and steady growth. Third, reduce the interest rates to very lower levels, aiming to reduce the inflation rate below 3%. Fourth, improve the education system. A mandatory kindergarten age of three years has been introduced in 2015. 
Besides, special allowances were introduced for teachers working in socio-economic disadvantaged localities. Moreover, the vocational education system was reformed, with increased work-based training, to reflect labor market needs. As a result, the Hungarian economy got a remarkably different picture, foreign currency-denominated loans have been nearly eliminated, consumption is rising, and interest rates have fallen dramatically. The government deficit was 1.9% of GDP in 2016. The Hungarian economy grew by 4-5% annually, starting the year 2017, till the COVID-19 collapse effect. This concludes the first part of this topic. Please let us know if you like it, by hitting the like button below. You can now answer all the questions listed at the beginning of the video. But I have a new question for you. Are you facing any of these economic problems in your land? Which one is the most impacting? Write your feedback in a comment below this video. Stay tuned for the second part, which will focus on countries with the highest interest rates in the world. You will see some shocking unbelievable rates, that indicates the severe economic problems, these countries were facing. In order not to miss the next part, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, by hitting the subscribe button below. And activating the bell. See you soon.